Ooh, first question came from my guy, Eddie. He said, the Lamar narrative. What's up, Engraving? It's been a while. I haven't been involved as much in the community. My bad. Please don't apologize for that. Life is much more important than these videos. Uh, he said, recently got married and moved. Oh, man, congrats on that, man. My boy's a newly married May. Welcome to married life. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, he said, uh, move to a house or so the planning of both has kept me pretty busy. But I thank you for your content, keeping me up to date with the latest on the Ravens. I have an interesting, interesting theory here. I'm sure all Ravens would have noticed the intense scrutiny that Lamar is being put under. No, a few bad words here and there are to be expected. It's been happening ever since he came into the league. To be honest, during a contract negotiation or contract year, it's to be expected. True. Uh, but I have a different take on the matter. I think the fact Lamar is negotiating a contract by himself on such a large scale is unprecedented. That's true. Uh, it creates a new dynamic in player power in the league. That's true. Because once this thing gets done, because, um, uh, again, this is not a, and no offense to those other positions, obviously, but this is not a running back. It's not an offensive lineman. It's not a receiver. It's not a tight end. It's not a cornerback. It's not a linebacker. It's not a defensive line. No, no, no. This is the highest paid position in football this is a quarterback, and this is not some backup quarterback. It's not a, a journeyman quarterback. No, this is a top-notch quarterback negotiating his own deal without an agent. People see it. People are going to see that, and they're going to be like, "Why? He got all of that. He did. Wow, really?" And agents don't like it because it, it messes stuff up for them. Especially a deal of this magnitude. There's not going to be no little rinky dink. Deal. No, this is the real deal. This is big money we're talking. So this could change the game. Uh, he said, for the sports agents, I think it presents a worrying sign if players decline representation and opt to do it by themselves. For owners and GMs in the league, it's also worrying because dealing with players directly means telling them what you feel they are worth. And if your views and potentially and if your views and potentially may lead to some players taking stakeholdership in the running of the club affairs. For example, if I'm Lamar, if you insist on paying me comparably lower than Murray, I'd want guarantees of a number one wide receiver with the extra money you're not paying, seeing as you may be saying I'm not worth that amount. See, I've seen some people float that around, but no, that that would be that would be a cutoff point for me. Like, yeah, we want Ravens to get them more weapons, but at the same time, it's like how how could they do that if, if they signed a, if they signed him to a deal and it was lower than Kyler Murray's and they said, all right, you you, you guaranteed to get me a number one wide receiver. How can they? Well, it would be in a contract, but at the same time, how can they guarantee that? But it's anyway, um, he said either way. My point is that there is a vested interest from multiple sides in GMs, owners, as well as agents to not see this succeed. That's true uh, because it gives unprecedented level of power to the players. Anyway, those are just my thoughts. Let me know what you think. Love for me and my family in the UK to you. Keep doing what you do. Hey, appreciate it. I don't know why. Um. I don't know why this his email went under spam. I mean, this, this definitely ain't no spam. Um, but yeah, once this thing is done, hey, maybe by the time you see this video, it'll be done. Probably not though. Not by the time you see this video. But um, this is will change everything, man. It will change everything, and it's it's, it's so many people. Yeah, just hoping that this thing goes bad, that it doesn't work out, that it doesn't get done. It's going to get done, whether now or later. Um, and, I mean, hopefully for Raven's sake, it'll be now, like sooner rather than later. Um, but we'll see. Uh, time is a ticking because once week one rolls around, that's it. No more talking, baby. Unless I, I, I bet, like, I bet, like, if, because I know look, Lamar, look, he did say, hey, we're going to cut it off. And I know that that's to put pressure on the Ravens. That That's putting pressure on them. That's like, hey, y'all need to up it quick. Because time's ticking. But I wonder if, if he would still cut it off. If Ravens like gave him an offer. Like it was like whoa. That was just crazy. Crazy good. Um, but yeah. This, this can change the game. For so many people in the NFL. Um, and not that. Even, even with agents. Even though a lot of agents. They don't like it. They looking at it like man. This, this could potentially take away some money out of our pockets. Not everybody's going to go that route. They're still players are still gonna continue to get agents, but then there's gonna be a lot of players that be like, oh, 
Lamar and his people, they did that. Okay, you know what? I'm going to do the same thing. I'm trying to keep all the money that I can possibly keep and keep it around me instead of having to pay that agent, what is it, 3% or however much it is. And obviously, the higher number of the contract, the higher that 3% is. Um, so it's it's like, man, it's <laughs> he, he's, he's waking up a lot of people to the possibilities of what could be done if you do your own thing. Yeah, this feels like a dream. Team Keep It Clean, welcome to another episode of NFL Questions from Subscribers. And the next questions came from my guy, Gold Morano, the Russian court. What's happening in Graven? I'm sure that you're hearing all the news. Kareem Hunt is asking for a trade. Uh, and J.K. Dobbins, he is back eligible off of the PUP list. Although it's highly unlikely that Cleveland would ever help the Ravens, would you give up a third or fourth round pick for Hunt if medical experts had determined that J.K. and or Gus would be unable to start the season? I would. Well, actually, no. 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 Um, no. No. Um, I would roll with, uh, with, with Beatty and Mike Davis and Justice Hill. Um, because, no. I know Kareem Hunt is very talented, but no. No. Because you, know you know that whole no, no, that no policy? Because initially, I, I thought about the talent, but then I remembered, oh, wait, wait a minute there, buddy. Yeah, that part. Um, but he said Mike Davis is cool and all, but Hunt would probably be an even greater help to Lamar in a rushing attack. Yeah, yeah, he he would be nice because he yeah he got all the talent in the world, but no, nah, I, I I wouldn't do it. And then he also said, "Are you seeing what I'm seeing?" I have to be, I have to know if the team keep a clean family, and you notice something that the diehard fan may not want to see, but seems to be becoming more impossible to overlook. I suppose that we can't blame EDC for fate of a player or how hard he prepares his body in the off season, but after his third NFL draft, there seems to be a recurring theme with our top draft picks. Injuries and or lack of production. The first three picks in our top tight end in the 22 class are all experiencing injuries already. Oh, well, Linda Baum, um, not Kyle Hamilton. Oh, and Ajabo. Well, he was already hurt. Uh, he said, I believe that 2021's first three picks have experienced injury in their short careers as well. Uh, Bateman, away in Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland was a third round. Oh, yeah, we didn't have a second round pick because that was to the trade for Orlando Brown Jr. Oh, Hmm. <laughs> Hold up now. You you may be a little on to something. Hold up now. You recently went over the 2019 draft class and where they all have ended up going. Uh, drafting players out of college who turn out to be often injured at the professional level may actually yield the same results as whiffing, swinging and missing on a draft pick. If a player spends more time off the field than on the field or when a player has to be handed, handled with kid gloves because he's not quite there, like Falele or Ben Mason, his value begins to diminish. Is EDC already showing a tendency to draft a good percentage of players who underperform, lack the fire or passion and hunger necessary to excel or have difficulty avoiding injury? Is it EDC's responsibility to know how well players take care of their bodies prior to the draft yeah that 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 is on him and of course his scouts and whatnot um to really do their homework when it comes to the injury history of these players sometimes it can be fluky stuff but other times it can be stuff that they have had reoccurring for a while uh is it the organization's responsibility to ensure players avoid torn ligaments and tendons once they walk through the castle doors well stuff happens stuff happens freak injuries happen um, so there's no way to really prevent that because, again, stuff happens. Um, but you do want to know extensive history on the guys that you're bringing in. And if they do have any existing issues and whatnot, you, you want to know about it. So where to where you either like, all right, well, that history is, is too much for me. I don't want to deal with it. Or you're like, all right, when you, when you get in here, we're going to take care of this. We're going to fix it. Uh, these trails seem to be a reoccurring theme over the past three years. Unlike James Prochet, players seem to be coming to camp soft, out of shape, and unprepared to win a starting job. When I say unprepared, I mean they don't appear to be spending their valuable time leading up to camp with personal trainers, yoga instructors, speed coaches, strength coaches, etc. Is it just me? 
EDC works hard, but is he off to a subpar start as GM or are players simply too spoiled and not displaying that Ray Lewis, Lamar Jackson work ethic? Ooh, that was a question right there. Um, mm, and that's a tough one because we, we, we don't know what they do in their off seasons. Um, and again, with injuries, they happen. And, and with, especially with training camp, like now, um, I think one of the biggest reasons that a lot of injuries happen too is because you go, you get to the off season, you, you the, the draft, free agency in March, drafts in April. You got a little mini camp, OTAs in like May, June, whatever. You get a break, then come back July. Oh, training camp. Now you got to tackle. Now it's physical. Now you're hitting people. Um, so that that drastic change, it, it 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 can be alarming for your body. It could be like, hey, whoa, oh, we hitting somebody now. Oh, okay, all right, well. Caught me off guard. Um, and then because you're doing things differently. You're not just running around in, in basketball shorts. You know, that no, you actually hitting now. Now it's really the pads coming on and stuff. Um, and now you're really trying to get your body ready for the season because it's gonna be you think there's a lot of hitting in the training camp. Oh, hitting now, here comes preseason. Now, now here comes the regular season. So um, it's just an adjustment. And it's important that guys do take care of their bodies. It's very important that guys take care of their bodies. Uh, because if you don't, then yeah, the results will speak for themselves. Um, and some is some again, like you talked about, some is uh, some is accident. Stuff just happens, uh, unfortunately. And that's again, that's my least favorite part about football is the injuries. Um, but yeah, that's that's a uh, tricky situation. And hopefully, uh, from everything that you were talking about, hopefully it's just coincidence. Training camp preview. Next question came from my boy, Mark. He said, what's going on, Engraven? Hope you and the family are doing well. I got some questions for you. Uh, EDC has been GM for about four years, and every year he made some sort of trade. Look at Marcus Peters, Calais Campbell, Yannick Ngakwe. You know what? I forget about the Yannick Ngakwe one a lot. He said, so sorry if I butchered that. Oh, no, nah, it's all good. I think you actually spelled it right. There might be one letter missing. But anyway, he said, you have a sharp mind and you've been right a lot of times. So if Ingr I don't know about that part. So if Engraven is GM, what trade is going down? Or was Hollywood's trade the trade for the year? No, I, I think they will still do something. But where? Um, Y'all know the trade that I'm hoping would go down. Um, but... What would be a position where the Ravens, if they traded for somebody, they could it could really like get him a boost besides a uh, wide receiver? Um, oh, mm, no, not a pass rusher because you got you're gonna have Bowser coming back. You got a Dafi away, Justin Houston. I don't think they would add somebody else there. Um, Cornerback, nah, you got a lot of guys there too. Safety, a lot of guys there. Maybe inside linebacker, not Raquan Smith though. Not, not, not him. I mean, yeah, so uh, yeah, maybe inside line, inside or out. No, in, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe like inside linebacker. I can see them trading for inside linebacker. Hopefully, they won't need to. Cause I mean, Patrick Queen and Malik Harrison, they doing their thing, and Christian Welch too. And hey, that'd be amazing. But that's one way I could see. Cause I mean, the only, the only one I can really think of again, wide receiver. That's the biggest one for me, because that's, that's the one that stands out the most. So, we'll see, though. Uh, he said, what's your opinion on Malik Harrison? Oh, man, nice little segue there. Uh, I, I love the guy coming out, but we really haven't gotten to see his full potential. Can Mikey, Mike McDonald, pull it out? What role do you think he will embrace more of? An all-around back, a Jared Johnson-type role, or an Albert, or Albert McClellan-type role? Um, based off of what the Ravens are going to try, uh, maybe a little bit of both, Jared Johnson and Albert McClellan. But hopefully, uh, yeah, we haven't got to see him much, because he just hasn't been out there that much. Um, it's scary because uh, again he's in scary territory. So they trying him out at inside, they try him out at outside. So he doesn't really have a role. So hopefully he'll um he'll be able to establish his role and like confidently establish his role and solidify like his spot on the defense. Not where oh we're gonna try you out here, we're gonna try you out there. No, solidify his spot on the defense. And hopefully for me, I'm hoping that it's at inside linebacker. I I, I really do. Um, because I would just love if. He got used at the position where they drafted him at, at inside linebacker. He is a thumper. He got a decent amount of speed too now, but he is a thumper. He ain't afraid to go head up with nobody. He's a good tackle. Like he can make it happen. I, I just want to see. Hopefully, they can, he can put it all together, and the Ravens can put it all together too. And with Mike McDonald's system, he can maximize him. Uh, he said, also, this would be an Aussie type move. LOL. Would you sign Dante Hightower? Uh, I thought about that when Vince went down. Prayers to him. Uh, I, I know he wanted to prove himself, and I was excited to see. Um, I Dante Hightower, I mean, couldn't hurt because Ravens, they they lacking that depth right now. 
Um, maybe we had to see what Bill Belichick would have to say. He said, lastly, uh, you think we give Makai Polk the Tim White treatment and try to stash him on a practice squad? You know what? That's funny because I hadn't been thinking about that. I'm sure once the, 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 we got down to where it was roster time, then, then that would maybe uh, come to my mind. But I have not been thinking about the stashing right now. Maybe because we're not even so far away from the roster cut down, but we're a little ways away. But that is a good point. So I'm sure there will be some guys that they do that with. They'll do the, the infamous, oh, injury reserve. Oh, man, he sneezed too hard, so we got to throw him on IR. Oh, man, oh, we heard him fart. We got to throw him on IR. That was a violent fart there, buddy. So, yeah. yeah, sorry for the essay. I just sent you, LOL. I figured I'd catch the wave of questions from subs. Real quick, thanks for all your content. I got a ton, tons of respect for you because you're doing what you love. You keep a cool head and you're humble. Peace, love, and blessings, and hope you enjoy the weekend because I'm going to. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate you a lot. Thank you for this. The last question on this episode came from my boy Greg and B. Moore. He said, the season is almost here, and it's exciting. Mark Andrews is the top receiving tight end, and if healthy, Nick Boyle is one of the best blockers at tight end in the league. With all rookie tight ends, Charlie Collar and Isaiah, Isaiah Likely, who do you think might have the better year? Well, I mean, Isaiah Likely, for sure, for how it's starting. Uh, Charlie Collar right now, he's out with injury, so he ain't getting off to the best start. Um, that's going to be nice when we get that notification. Oh, Charlie Collar's back on the practice field. Like, okay. He said, Charlie was, I mean, excuse me, Car Car Collar was drafted first, but I've been hearing more good stuff about Likely and not really much at all about Collar. Yeah, yeah, because he's, he's been out with injury. Uh, he said, could be like how Dennis Pitta was a second tight end after, drafted after Ed Dixon or Mark Andrews drafted after Hayden Hurst. Could history repeat itself with a second tight end drafted being the most successful? Hopefully, both are great later and hope you and the fam are doing well. Yeah, that's where history is headed right now <laughs> because, again, they he's been out. Charlie Collar's been out. And Isaiah Likely has not just been in, but he's been continuously making play after play after play after play after play. So when you're doing that, you're setting yourself up and a team for a lot of success. So hopefully Isaiah likely won't just be it won't just be training camp hype, but it'll translate to the preseason and then of course the regular season and then hopefully the playoffs and then hopefully the Super Bowl. We we'll talk about that later. Yeah, this feels like a Shout out to Graven.